everyone. Welcome. Uh, there's no Alex Cox this week. Uh, he's uh, been called away, so you've got to make do with second best. Uh, I'm Miko Cleland, and I'm uh, licensing manager for Find My Past. And I am uh, here to talk to you about all the great new record releases we've had this week and generally find out about how you've been getting on and talk about wonderful, wonderful records. This is our exciting Friday TV show on a, on a budget, um, available in all your uh, wonderful computer screens. And we're going um, to, we're you definitely aren't second best. Uh, we've got Chris Lang says, hi folks, Miko, nice to see you back on Friday Live. Nice to see you as well. Uh, we're uh, working full speed with uh, all kinds of cool technology. So Alex uses an iPad. I use a piece oh, of paper. You gave it away. <laughs> tied to an iPad because I don't know how it turns on. This is how this works, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Max, as usual, is on the controls. He's going to show off lots of pictures and tell me all about the questions and answers that are coming through so we can have a bit more of a back and forth. Uh, this is going to be hopefully a gravely interesting presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about lots and lots of different little bits. Uh, I'm going to give you some tips to walk away with and I'm going to maybe help to jog your memory a little bit to some other things you might do and we're going to have a bit of a talk as well. So first of all, uh, the big question that we asked uh, yesterday was uh, what's the longest lived ancestor that you know of or you've found in a family tree or just the person who's lived the longest that you found record of? Um, there's a picture that we have, Max, uh, which is um, 120 year old in a cemetery that we managed to come across. And uh, that's quite a long one, but have you found anything bigger? Have you got any ancestors or perhaps even in one of those shared trees, maybe someone has got the names and dates a little bit wrong and confused and, and you find someone is a little bit older than they should be and they're maybe thinking about their child or grandchild. What are the ages that you've come across? Uh, how can you think they could be explained? And uh, maybe uh, show us some pictures of your ancestors that maybe have lived long enough to see the age of photography and we can share those together. So that's our big question. Yeah, it's really good actually. We had quite a few uh, comments come in before the uh, live broadcast. Um, so we've got uh, uh, Vivian Wren said, uh, my paternal grandmother, uh, she died three months before her 101st birthday. Wow. So at least she got that uh, uh, telegram from the Queen or yes. letter nowadays, I suppose. I think it's a letter, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't got mine yet, uh, so I can't compare. But uh, yes, yeah, so I haven't got any uh, myself uh, at that sort of level. But I have found something that might be of interest that will reveal at the end of the programme. And if you can find something that beats this, then maybe we'll have a special prize. I'll try and think of something good for you. But I've got a feeling you might not be able to. So this is a bit of a challenge. I guess you've got half an hour to start digging and try and find someone very old indeed and with some kind of evidence. Um, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, a scientific, but some kind of document that tells you their age. Um, so there we go, let's go from there. Uh, so uh, let's start with our... Sorry to interrupt, but uh, we've actually got Rosie Walters before the broadcast said her maternal grandmother died at the age of 104. Wow. And she looked like she was actually the winner, but Sue Pooley Eliza, 107 years old, was her husband's so, great aunt. That's fantastic. Um, there are recorded cases of people being in their sort of early 120s that are accepted as being true. So you know, there are some long lived people out there. It's very rare, but it can happen. Um, and uh, then, of course, in history, it's a lot harder to verify how old people are. So sometimes it gets a little bit lost in time. So that might be uh, one way of maybe getting confused and finding someone who appears to be a lot older than maybe in real life they actually are. Uh, we're going to talk then about the new records that have been released. It's been a really big set of records this week. Lots and lots of things from different places. There have been about 7 million American land purchases. And they're a huge resource if any of you have ancestors that moved across to the states. Of course, these are the people especially that will be purchasing land from the government, perhaps to build a homestead or a farm. And you can take a look at those and maybe you might find a map, you might find some detail of these people migrating and starting their new lives. Uh, on the other side of the world. So that's a really interesting resource. If maybe cousins disappear or anything, uh, worth taking a look, type in some surnames and type in the sort of uh, times that you're looking at and maybe you'll find a missing cousin and in there get the information to prove it. But we also have Catholic registers. We have a huge set of Catholic registers. Find My Past is the home of British and Irish Catholics as well as Catholics from around the world. So we have lots from the English-speaking world, uh, lots of places in America as well. 
and um, of course uh, if you have perhaps Irish ancestors when they move to another country they may not convert they may stay Catholic and so we might have to look into these records to find more information when you look at parish records remember they're the established church, they're the Church of England, and uh, that means that perhaps, although there was a time uh, where you had to be married in the established church, even if you were of another faith, uh, exception of Quakers and Jews, the fact that there's another church out there that has their own records, and these records have been privately held. Uh, sometimes they're kept in an archive as a custodian, but they're owned by the church, not by the government like these uh, Church of England records. So that means that you may never have been able to look at them. And when they're online, we can search through. And that might be why you can't find the name of someone or find their children being baptised, is because they're not actually of the faith that you're looking in those records. So when we think of uh, parish registers, remember that's only uh, part of the story. There are other faiths out there, and those non-conformists and Catholics and other religions are just as important to take a look at, especially if you can't find someone. Even in those times when Catholicism was persecuted quite heavily in the early years of um, the sort of 1700s and uh, early 1800s and the late 1600s, where there was maybe still about between sort of one and four percent of the country were Catholic, even when they were hiding and under very sort of vicious pain of persecution if they were found. So it's still worth taking a look at these records, especially, as I said, if you have Irish migrant ancestors and more. Maybe you have some Italian ancestors, all these people, perhaps they're in the Catholic churches. And we have records from all over the country as well, and that's growing. It's a huge collection. So that's our first big release uh, today. And of course, then that brings us to our larger topic. Uh, these are records that people are dying to get into. These are burial records. Uh, we have over 700,000 records from uh, many different family history societies around the country. And they are going into the National Burial Index, which is created by as many family history societies as you can shake a stick at. Uh, lots and lots of societies have come together to create this. And it's a huge resource. It's a wonderful resource. Lots and lots of local experts have come together to fill in details, to give you the names and dates, and that means we can finish some family stories. Although, death is not the end, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that shortly. Um, we're going to sort of maybe tie some things together. So let's start, perhaps, by talking about why burials are so important. Um, there's hopefully uh, a photograph that's maybe flashing up on screen of uh, me with my five times great-grandparents. They're in Cornwall, in a little place called St Blasey. And uh, that's uh, a great chance to come uh, face to face with them and to learn a little bit more about them. What I didn't know and didn't get to understand when I look at a burial record is when I see their stone, there's a wonderful little poem on the stone and I can maybe learn a bit more about them using these extra details that are on these stones. And these burial records can get you to these places. But there are other things that they can tell you. There are wonderful stories, not only just in the records, but in the stones themselves. Um, an interesting story that you may have heard of, it's something that uh, I find quite powerful, and especially as we've talked about Catholic records today. Um, we know that there's um, been a little bit of uh, enmity between Protestants and Catholics historically, uh, so we're going to show you uh, a very sort of magical grave, a very powerful one. Uh, this is uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, this is a story of a romance between a Protestant and a Catholic. And uh, they uh, lived in the mid-1800s. The husband died in, I think, 1880, and his wife died in 1888. And uh, when they died, his wife decided uh, not to be buried in the family plot. She decided to be buried as close to the wall as she could because Catholics and Protestants couldn't be buried in the same place. And so, uh, when she was buried, and when they were buried on either side of this wall, they put these stone hands together across the wall to make sure that they could be holding hands forever. Uh, a wonderful story that can really show the depth of some love between a, a couple, between these two partners. And um, it's something that, again, the stones can tell us a bit more about our ancestors. And that's really, really useful and really, really important. Um, have you visited any of your, grand uh, your ancestors' graves? Uh, have you found anything interesting when you've got there? Uh, tell us. Uh, it will be really interesting to find out. Um, maybe you've got a family crypt or mausoleum or plot and uh, maybe there's some extra relatives in there that you found just by visiting. Uh, have you been unable to find uh, the stones, even if you're in the right cemetery? So maybe there's some tips we could give. 
Uh, there's lots and lots of things there to talk about um, and hopefully maybe we can share some stories ourselves. Um, in terms of uh, those family graves and perhaps if you've uh, got some interesting ones yourself, um, we're going to show you something that might make you think a little bit. So, um, have you ever heard of the Metropolitan Sepulchre? So in the 1820s, if you have London ancestors, this will be especially important, London was quite full. So um, they were bursting at the seams of living people, let alone understanding what they had to do for the dead. And so they invited some proposals for how to deal with this. And there was one particular proposal in the rush of Egyptology, uh, where people got very excited by all everything um, Egyptian, and were to build a pyramid on Primrose Hill, if you know where that is, it's now a park. And uh, this pyramid was going to put all of the dead of London inside. Um, it is a huge building that was going to be made on a 18-acre uh, site, more than 90 storeys tall. And at the top, it was going to have an obelisk, uh, again, feeding into that Egyptology craze, and an observatory at the top to watch the stars. It would still be taller than St Paul's Cathedral now. It's a massive thing. Um, and if all of the dead of London were put into this from the 1820s to now, uh, we'd probably almost be full. So that just gives you a, an idea of it. So when you think about what it's like inside, and we have some pictures of it inside, uh, the proposals, it was going to be almost like a honeycomb of all of these tombs that would contain all of the dead of London, probably around about five million dead in total. And so that's a huge thing that would just be absolutely monolithic. Um, it wasn't accepted as a proposal, and uh, they decided to go for the ring of garden cemeteries that you might see, uh, Highgate and others, Abney Park, etc., uh, around London. Uh, Quite were... a drastic difference, isn't it? Okay. It is. Oh, let's sack off the pyramids and go with the Highgate Cemetery instead. It was more of a French thing. Um, Père Lachaise, if you've ever been to some of the Parisian cemeteries, are much more like gardens, and they're seen as a, a romantic, kind of beautiful way to respect the dead. Whereas this was, I guess, a little more fashionable. And although ancient Egypt is quite timeless, uh, the trend for the excitement about ancient Egypt, I think, ebbed and flowed a little bit, and uh, it maybe sort of fell out of favour. Um, and I can't imagine how long it would have taken to build, and how expensive it would have been as well. So I, I think perhaps we uh, dodged something a little there, and uh, I don't know how I would enjoy living in London with that looming over me uh, at all times. So that's one thing to... Uh, to think about that when we've just very narrowly avoided um, one of those interesting stories. Uh, so as well as this, we've had some stories, we've shared some things. Um, anything coming in on the... Yeah, yeah, some really good things here. Um, so Chris Lang was very lucky, arrived at the entrance to a churchyard last year with the intention of having to hunt for her great-great-grandparents mm -hmm. to her joy their headstones and those for other family members were a few yards in front of her. Wow, that's exciting, that's brilliant, that's a stroke of luck, isn't it? That's uh, great. Uh, I've got another one. This is actually a question for you around um, burials. So, um, I, uh, Julia Green asks, hi Julia, she says, I have located burial plots, but they have no headstones. Apart from costs, why else could this be? So, this brings us quite neatly to a set of tips that I've prepared to get you started with burial records, and, and that's one of the tips. So, uh, people didn't always have memorials made out of stone. Uh, sometimes they're made out of slate, sometimes they're made out of sandstone, which wore away quite quickly, especially in certain areas where different stones were more popular or easier to get hold of. Um, so many people who were working class might have had wooden memorials, and these wooden memorials, of course, haven't lasted and haven't survived. If you find burial records, uh, your ancestors are going to be buried in perhaps this parish church or perhaps a, a metropolitan cemetery if we're looking after sort of the 1850s. And, and that would be a council burial book or something like that instead. But that doesn't mean that the stone survives or the memorial survives. So you can be at the place where your ancestor was buried and you might even find the plot and be able to work it out. But perhaps time has just defeated us. One thing that you could do in this case is that a lot of family history societies have been around for a long time and they have either inherited the work of people who have uh, copied down monumental inscriptions from earlier days or they've been around and they've been doing this for a long time. So in that case there may be an earlier book of monumental inscriptions or an earlier version of people who have written and transcribed what's written on stones that may have worn away or may not even exist anymore and been taken down. Sometimes maybe councils or churches will do that if they're unsafe 
or perhaps if weather has destroyed them. So these may be a good place to look to see if there is a memorial inscription inside. Uh, I've seen some books written in the 1880s, for example, and the stones now are completely illegible, but I've been able to get a full uh, copy of what was written by looking at these earlier stones. Uh, one particular uh, society that I've been working with in Scotland have done some amazing work with buried stones. So when you go to a cemetery, and please don't do this yourselves, because it's one of those don't try this at home things, where they've taken a survey of the ground and they've found stones that have fallen over and then over time been covered up by the soil. And they've been able to turn them over very delicately and using very sort of specialist knowledge um, and transcribe and take photos of those stones so that that knowledge is restored and uh, kept. And these are very, very old inscriptions that are very well preserved as well. So, you know, they are uh, definitely still there. And sometimes if you're in a cemetery and you may see a little... Um, mound, perhaps it may be the remains of a buried stone and things, so you know, they do exist. As I said, don't please look for them yourself, especially don't take a spade to a graveyard and start digging because there are numerous laws and reasons why that's not a good idea. Just but, generally frowned upon. <laughs> I would say so. Um, but uh, perhaps get in touch again with the local family history society, uh, maybe even the local council, and they might be able to help you a little bit more. Um, it's, it's interesting, actually, there's a few people coming with some comments related around the, um, the lack of um, headstone. Mm -hmm. um, so Sue Kelly says, I found my relative in a grave that was reused as there hadn't been a memorial stone. Uh, she found the details in an old burial book. Um, and also there's a couple of questions, if you've got time for a question. Yes, of course, yes. Um, so, uh, Nick Hancock, hi Nick, he says, uh, why were christening and burial records recorded but not date of birth slash death? Says so thinking pre-1837 registration. Yes. Well, if you think about this, it's, it's where the church comes in. So um, the church doesn't really mind when you're born. Um, dutiful uh, priests might decide to record it uh, as a, a matter of course. But they are paid for the christening ceremony and they perform the christening ceremony and then that's, that's their job done. So they're not really there for the birth or part of it. Um, so that's why they're not in there. Um, the government wants to know that people are alive and that's why you know they started with birth records and they want to know these things but the church really wants to make sure that they're baptized and if they're not baptized then they want to know why but they they're interested in that section and the same with burials. Um, if someone is uh, buried um, there's an assumption usually it's within a few days of death and you can usually say it's two or three days sometimes the day after sometimes on the day um, but for very many reasons, uh, not very long afterwards. And uh, when it is, there's usually a very specific reason, like perhaps um, a coroner needs to look at something and it needs to be a post-mortem. But uh, for the most part, again, the cemetery, uh, the uh, church, only cares about the date that the burial took place because that's the bit that they're involved with. So that's the thing. So uh, there are other ways you can get hold of this information. So sometimes dutiful priests will write it down. Not always. Uh, more often they won't. And then there are other records that might help. Uh, and I am going to cover a few very shortly as well. So in terms of these extra tips, um, another tip, of course, is that people weren't always buried where they were born. So in the 1700s, Almost half of the people weren't uh, buried in the parish that they were born in. So think about this when you're taking your family history search. We have a, a new slider on our website where you can search with a bit of a, a radius and move uh, larger and smaller and radiuses. People, unless perhaps you're talking about Yorkshire and Lancashire, when people saw a uh, county boundary, it wasn't a hard brick wall they couldn't cross. Uh, they could just move along the way and keep on with their lives, and people did. And so if you're looking for people on perhaps a county boundary or something like that, this will really help. Most people stayed within around about a 20-mile radius. They didn't really move past that unless there was a really big event. So perhaps in the West Country, in Devon and Cornwall, uh, when the mines started to dry up, people moved anywhere they could find work. And then, of course, when other people left, then the businesses that supported those industries also then had less work and then they moved also. So that might be one reason. And there are some big events that may have happened in history uh, that may cause this. But outside of that, 20 mile radius is your idea and take a look there and don't discount those people who might be a parish or two over. And so when you're looking at those burial records, think about that when you're going through and even think about things that might be 
in the next county over, as long as it's in that 20 mile radius, it's worth taking a look at and worth exploring in more detail. And so when we talk about other records and things that might help, uh, death is not the end. Um, they say in different places, I enjoy uh, collecting these sorts of phrases. Um, in Russia, they say you live as long as you're remembered. And um, in some places, some people tell me it's Yorkshire, some Cornwall, some people say it's Wales, but I've heard it from a few different places, that everyone dies three times. First, when they take their last breath. Secondly, when their body returns to the earth. And the third time, when their name is spoken for the last time. And of course, in family history, it's our job to make sure these people never die. They never go away because their name is always being spoken because we're custodians of their memory. And so we need to then take a look at other records to fill in the details and add more. Uh, so if you have a burial record, yes, there may be a death record if we're looking after 1837, but there are other things. There are wills, uh, there are probate calendars. A national probate calendar is on Palm My Past. Uh, starts in the 1850s, 1858. Before then, uh, there are the Prerogative Court of Canterbury, Prerogative Court of York. There are um, dioceses that have wills, uh, local sort of wills that can go through. Your local archive may have some. We've got a huge collection of wills, I think the largest online, but definitely take a look for your county. And you'll usually find either an index or in some cases, the actual wills themselves, which are huge documents and they're full of detail. One of my favourite record sets I think I've mentioned before on here is the wills of famous people. And you can find those on our website and they are wonderful. There's about 500 of them, if I'm right, uh, but it's quite a few. And there is in Kingdom Brunel, Josiah Westwood, uh, Wedgwood, um, there's uh, Jane Austen, all kinds of people that you can find out exactly who they left their property to, their relatives, their friends, what they owned. It's a fascinating sort of look through the keyhole and that can give you a good example of what wills can contain. And if you get far enough back, and I'm sure you'll find someone who has enough property to leave a will, although especially as you get further back it was uh, less common. Those wills are useful, but then there are also things like uh, death duty registers, which we have. These are the taxes payable if someone had uh, property to give. And so, you know, the only two things certain are death and taxes. And these registers, again, give you a lot of extra details. So when you find a burial record, and hopefully you will in this new collection now going up to eight, uh, 11 million records in this National Burial Index, said so covering the whole country, uh, then uh, those records then mean that you should start plugging in those names to wills, to probate, to those tax records, to other records that are related to death. Use our subcategory for uh, birth, marriage and death and look for records in that category and see perhaps there might be other things. There are records of the Great Western Railway shareholders, for example. Um, you may not think that your ancestors had shares, but you know, there, there are many, many names in here and these are the extra things. Try and think of this as almost like a checklist and work down the list to say, well, okay, well, if I have his burial, have I looked for a death? If I look in newspapers, I may find an obituary, I may find a death notice. An obituary tends to be about a week after a death notice. Um, so uh, take a look in later editions of the same newspaper and maybe you'll find something. You might even find a photograph of the deceased. And so there are absolutely fantastic things to find if you start running down this list and say, well, is there been any kind of probate? Has a will been found? And just keep looking through and until you're very, very certain you've looked through everything and you've either found or proven that it's not there, then keep that list open and keep looking for those things. If you know that someone's buried somewhere, have you looked for a monumental inscription? Have you been to the cemetery or have you sort of tried to find out to see if you can find some kind of memorial? Everything can help. It's all a jigsaw and it all comes together to make a grand thing that can help tell that ancestor's story and make sure that we never forget who they were. What else do we have, Max? Mm -hmm. I know I've been talking for far too long, or maybe like the sign of my own no, I, too much. No, no, I, it's been really good. Um, I'm, I'm just, a bit, oh, no, just a bit concerned about the time because at half four, the people are going to start making noise in the office. So let's try and rattle through this as quickly as possible. Okay. We've got a couple of really good questions. So um, this one's uh, uh, quite, I don't know if you know the answer, quite broad one. It says, mm -hmm. a few of my family were buried in Manchester cemeteries, which are now playing fields or parks. Mm -hmm. What happens to, re to the remains in these graves? Are they moved or just covered? Also, what happens to the memorials? For the most part, they tend to remove the memorials and leave bodies. Um, uh, an example I can think of is Westminster Abbey. Uh, if you've ever been to Westminster Abbey, there's a large garden outside. That garden was the churchyard of Westminster Abbey 
and they just took the stones away. Uh, the council actually store the stones. I've been trying to get hold of one of them for quite some time um, just to get a, a find out what's on there, but they're in a warehouse somewhere, I was told by someone in the council. Um, they may be stored, they may be moved somewhere. In some cases, I know that they've been broken up or they've been used as paving slabs, depending also on the sort of year and era and outlook of your local council as to what they might do and how much they care about history, the, the answer might be different. But I would assume it's a very expensive thing to um, exhume bodies and to put them into another place. Uh, if there was perhaps a very special reason for doing so, it may have happened, but for the most part, these people will still be there. So if you do go to that playing field, then you are standing where your ancestors are and take heart in that. Um, maybe if you can find an earlier map of plots, you might be able to work out exactly where they are. And I would get in touch with the local council or the local church, if it's a churchyard or something like that, to say, do you know what has happened to these stones? And maybe they've kept some. Sometimes they can make a little, almost like a census of these stones before they get rid of them so that they have a record. Any of these things can really help you. So take a look at that and that would be my next port of call, I think. Um, on the subject of when you're talking about uh, visiting graveyards, mm -hmm. uh, Limby Thomas says, graveyards need to have a portal loo. I always need the loo within minutes of getting there. <laughs> Is that something that you've experienced as well, Miko? It's not. I mean, I, I do enjoy a graveyard. Um, I, I go to as many as I can find them when I'm on holiday or often sneak into one and just take a look at uh, the different memorials that are found and, and find it quite fascinating and really interesting, especially in Europe where often they have photographs of the deceased on there and sometimes they're a little bit more elaborate. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, often, a lot of these local churches are open and maybe try in there that might be helpful <laughs> I was going to say actually um, would you, it's a bit of a morbid subject but what's the, probably the most interesting graveyard that you've been to um, um, mm. and how far afield is it would you recommend people visit because I, on that topic I, I went to New Orleans fairly recently and obviously their, yeah. their cemeteries are amazing all the, all the yeah, mini mausoleums I even, I even saw Nicolas Cage's crypt to be yes the pyramid yes. <laughs> that's right yes, I, I know of that one I've been there too <laughs> um, uh, it's got a crack in it as well now after some uh, things and no one knows if Nicolas Cage knows about the crack I remember hearing about that well he might do now <laughs> yes sorry Nicholas. the uh, most interesting one I would say probably um, I do really like the the Parisian sort of garden cemeteries and also the, you know, there's some interesting cemeteries in London that do the same Highgate has got a wonderful tour if you get a chance to take a look at the the, the guided part of the cemetery uh, but uh, I think no one really does death uh, like um, those that sort of do the big momentum mori and things. Uh, Greyfriars Cemetery in Edinburgh, I think, has a very sort of special part on the list, um, just purely because it's so old. It has so many different stories. Every single stone you can go through has these fantastic carvings that are um, almost magical, uh, many quite heavily worn away about the names that come through um, the stories of the Covenanters that were left outside in this open prison um, and all of these different hundreds of thousands of people have been buried there over the times um, everything is in there that's a wonderful place to take a look at and to walk through it's open during the day and the night uh, I would start by going during the day and if you feel brave enough maybe go back at night um, and uh, maybe if you're feeling very brave maybe take a, a look on Wikipedia or Google and have a look for Bloody Mackenzie and um, see if you feel brave enough to knock on his tomb and uh, let me know how that goes. But there are some nice stories in there as well. You probably know about Greyfriars Bobby, the dog that kept watch over his uh, dead master's grave and things. So that's somewhere that has it all really. So I think of all these different wonderful magical places, um, Greyfriars has scary sort of macabre stories, but it has heartwarming tales and it has so many things in it. And that's all this is really about. It's all about the stories. And so that's why I think that's my favorite. Yeah, Greyfriars has had a couple of mentions in the comments, and uh, uh, Elsa Churchill um, from Society of Genealogists mm -hmm. says, uh, Abney Park is pure gothic. Yes. And, yeah, I think it's, it's quite an amazing aesthetic. Um, right, I've got quite a specific question for you now. I don't know okay. if um, you know the answer, but I'm going to give it a go anyway. So um, Paul Van Dudson, hi Paul if you're watching, um, says, My great-great-great-grandfather died in 1881. Mm -hmm. I found it in your monumental inscriptions. Mm -hmm. When I contacted the church, they said all their records were destroyed in a fire. Mm -hmm. But why doesn't he have a BND reference? I can't find his death at all. Um... If the church's records were destroyed, that shouldn't matter if it's a monumental inscription because this relates to a stone or, or some kind of you know, 
uh, memorial. So I would say then your, your port of call is to try and find that, uh, whether it's in the church, whether it's a sort of a memorial inside, or if it's a gravestone outside, that will be the place to look. Their burial records may well have been destroyed, and that's a, another kind of record, um, and that will be unfortunate. Uh, sometimes it happens, and I you know it's, it's terrible, but take a look at bishop's transcripts as well, which is a second copy of records sent to the bishop. Um, every year and that might give you the information. It tends to be a little more sparse but that sort of period it should exist and those bishops transcripts might give you a second chance to find a burial date um, although uh, again the memorial inscription if you find the stone that's another thing to add to your collection and take a photo of and uh, add that too. And there's some suggestions in the comments on a group field trip to, to Grave Friars. Um, also, it, it, must be, it must be said that it was noticed, your, some of your puns you were slipping in earlier. Good. A hashtag Good. has sprung up, hashtag Nico Dad Jokes. <laughs> I have a feeling that's one gift that we'll keep on giving. <laughs> yeah. It's terrible. I put the fun into funeral. Uh, there then. we go, there we go. Um, so, and, uh, I'm here all week. <laughs> I was going to say, well, well you actually, no, that brings a nice, you're back next week. That's yes, so I am. Uh, as you may know, or, or you may guess, uh, with my responsibility being uh, Scottish records and find my past, uh, there's a very uh, notable birthday next week. Uh, I can't promise there won't be any poetry, uh, but uh, we have some exciting Scottish announcements and some things to talk about uh, then. So I'll be seeing you next week as well, but with Alex as well, so you don't have to listen to just me. Uh, I think uh, you know you can uh, relax your ears a little bit there. <laughs> Maybe we can all have a wee dram together. <laughs> of Iron Brew, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yes. of Iron Brew, yeah. Uh, we'd like to maybe do that. <laughs> um, I was going to say as well, um, on the subject of graveyards um, being fantastic, Cindy Pennington says, graveyards are a common obsession with family historians. Another good question, which would be, which one is your favourite? Mine is the Glasgow Necropolis at the moment, oh, so we yes. already got to that. Uh, but she says, transcribing and preserving local graveyards are one of the great things that local family history groups do. So support your local family history Very society. Much. We can't get anywhere without the volunteers that go out and rain or shine and take pictures or transcribe these records because they do wear away. The weather gets to them. The elements, especially in these smoother stones, these things like sandstone, then the message is lost. And when it's lost, we don't know who lies beneath. And that's a really important thing. So uh, we can't do anything without our work with family history societies. And that's why we're so proud of our connection to them. Uh, another reason why uh, next week's release is kind of exciting. But um, do uh, support your local family history society, join them if possible, visit them for their meetings, go to research with them, and um, if you can, volunteer to help because you know they uh, are just fantastic when it comes to creating records and we're very proud to have a home for them here at Find My Past. Um, on back to the question of the week, just because yes. I think we need to get wrapping up now. Um, there was someone earlier, that, which I've lost the comment of, was someone where they had someone that said it was recorded as being uh, 200 and something. Uh -huh. Oh no, it's right here, I've got it, right. So, Thomas Kahn, this is from Chris Lang. Thomas mm -hmm. Kahn, buried in 1588 in St. Leonard's Shoreditch, aged 207. Ah. Debatable, as it could be 107. Well, <laughs> I, I see the logic, and that's fine. I, well, I did realise when I said... Uh, uh, any kind of documentary evidence that could be used. Uh, I did leave myself open for someone perhaps quoting the Bible, as there are some very long-lived people in that. Um, but no one, I hope, took the easy route um, and uh, used that as a, as a way of getting uh, a long-lived uh, person. But uh, there is uh, a reference that I found which is, is hopefully going to be quite exciting, and you have to decide for yourself whether it's true or not. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, guide you into uh, allowing my doubt to uh, come across through the camera to you. Um, but there was a man named Walter Bower who was an abbot of uh, Inchcombe Abbey in Scotland. Um, and he recorded uh, the death of a 361-year-old knight named John. And he died in 1138, supposedly. So that means then that he would have been born in 777 AD, which is the time of Charlemagne. So um, he died then in the time of King Stephen. And so that's 14 generations that he lived through of monarchy. And that's kind of uh, a long stretch, some would say. Uh, but uh, that's the longest that I've 
managed to get hold of, managed to find. Um, this knight was supposedly Arthurian as well, so perhaps again the dates are a little bit mixed up. Call me skeptical. I would I'm say not so sure. Probably a little bit more research. I'd like to see the pedigree on that. I'd like to see the family tree, and uh, again, we always need a few more records. So that is another reason why we always say research, see the records for yourself, because. I think maybe someone needs to go and take another look at that one because that, that doesn't quite add up, does it? Right, well, I've had an absolutely fantastic time. Thank you so much for joining us, Miko. That's all right. Thank you, everyone, for coming and listening. Um, it's been a wonderful time, and I hope you've learned something. I definitely have enjoyed myself. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing lots of things with you next week, and uh, hopefully you'll be finding some great things over the course of the week in our new records, or, of course, the billions of old records that we have, uh, although they're all old records. If you do find something great, share it with us on Facebook or tweet to us and uh, maybe then um, we'll get to see that as well and sort of share in that wonderful joy of finding something new. So thanks very much for joining us. <laughs> just before you go, I just want to <laughs> read out this comment. It's amazing. So Olive Sharp, hi Olive. She says, uh, my hubby and I got separated while looking around an Edinburgh cemetery. I shouted, where are you Ron? Can you hear me? The look on the faces of three guys standing outside the pub across the road was priceless. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we'll see you soon. Cool. Take care. Bye. Take care.